All right, this lecture is about uh, eukaryotic cell structure and function. Uh, this will be sort of a shorter lecture, and then there'll be a separate one about eukaryotic pathogens, where we talk about individual types of eukaryotes and examples of pathogens in that group. Now, eukaryotic cells, uh, you already know some basic things about eukaryotic cells. Of course, they have organelles. Um, they do have a nuclear envelope that surrounds the, the genetic information, multiple copies of a segmented genome, ADS ribosomes, never have peptidoglycan. These are some generalized uh, features of a eukaryotic cell. Now, as we look at this picture of a generalized eukaryotic cell, um, you will notice that there are lots of different types of organelles and structures in a eukaryotic cell. Not all eukes have all of these organelles. So an obvious one here would be a chloroplast. Not all eukes have a chloroplast. But there are other things as well. Not all eukes have flagella. They don't all have microvilli. The glycocalyx can differ. So there is some specialization uh, to certain eukaryotic cells. Now, how to start here? We're going to go basically the same, same uh, methodology that we used in a prokaryote. We're going to start from the outside and work our way in. The outermost structure here of a eukaryotic cell is the same as it was for a proc, and that is the flagella. So we'll start there. Now the eukaryotic flagella, um, the structure of the eukaryotic flagella is significantly different than the prokaryotic flagella. Um, I talked quite a bit about the prokaryotic flagella in the bacteria lecture. I uh, talked about structure and function. I'm going to do the same here for eukes because it is so significantly different. Um, the, what it's made out of is different. In a eukaryote, the flagella is made up of what we call microtubules. Microtubules uh, also form the cytoskeleton, which we'll see in a little bit. The cytoskeleton inside of the cell. And those microtubules extend from the cytoskeleton out to form the flagella. So the flagella is all connected to this inner network of cytoskeleton uh, because it's all made of microtubules. If you look at actually how uh, the microtubules are arranged into a flagella, you see that there are nine pairs of microtubules around the outside of the flagella and one pair in the center. They call that a 9 plus 2 arrangement. Um, they call a 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. The reason I'm bringing that to your attention is because sometimes they refer to a flagella as being a 9 plus 2 flagella. And I want you to realize that just means it's a eukaryotic flagella. Um, the 9 plus 2 arrangement is how the microtubules form a flagella. Um, the flagella of a eukaryotic cell is also completely covered by the cell membrane. Um, if you remember, in a prokaryote, the flagella was truly stuck on the surface. It was outside of the cell. But that's not true in a euke. In a euke, the cell membrane surrounds this cell and then goes all the way down to surround this flagella and come back up the other side and then around the rest of the cell. So the flagella really doesn't extend from the surface of the cell. It is part of the cell because it is covered by the cell membrane. That's different in a proke. Remember, prokes, it is truly stuck on the surface, not enclosed by the cell membrane. Also, remember, in prokaryotes, there are no microtubules. What makes up the, the prokaryotic flagella is a protein called flagellin. So that's another fundamental difference here. So because the flagella is made of these microtubules that are all connected to the cytoskeleton, it cannot rotate. If a eukaryotic flagella attempted to rotate, it would be breaking all of the cytoskeleton that's inside of the cell. So that is not, uh, not possible. In a proke, of course, the flagella rotates 360 degrees, but in a euke, it doesn't do that. Instead, what happens uh, is these microtubules actually slide past each other a sliding motion. Um, they kind of slide back and forth over one another and that causes this whip-like motion. Um, no doubt you've seen like sperm swimming and, and their, their flagella whips back and forth. And that's the kind of motion that you always see with a eukaryote. And you will never see 360 degree rotation because uh, it's not possible due to the flagella's structure. 
So structurally, the flagella of a proch and a euch are very different. However, the job of the flagella is the same. The job is motility. Uh, so the eukaryotic cell uses its flagella for motility just like a prokaryotic cell uses its flagella for motility. Another structure that's uh, off the surface of the cell here, these are cilia. Um, cilia are structurally similar to flagella. They are made up of microtubules and 9 plus 2 arrangements, but they're shorter, they're more numerous. They're actually not very common in, in uh, the eukaryotic world. You don't see these cilia very often. They look sort of like little hairs stuck on the surface of the cell. They're only found on one group of protozoans. The ciliates um, have these cilia. They use them for motion. They, they beat these, um, these hairs, these cilia together, beating them all together in order to force the cell through the media, allowing it to movement. Uh, some animal cells also have cilia, and those animal cells use them for filtering and sometimes for feeding processes. Uh, so, for example, <clears throat> cells of our respiratory tract have cilia on them, and they beat to, mu to move mucus around in our respiratory tract. Uh, so that's cilia. Cilia are either for motility, feeding, or filtering. Um, and, and they are structurally similar to the flagella, just shorter and more numerous. Also, outside of the cell structure, of course, is the glycocalyx. We saw the glycocalyx with a prokaryote. Um, the glycocalyx, of course, does come into direct contact with the environment. Uh, it is composed generally of polysaccharides, carbohydrates, or sugars. Um, that's true in both a prokaryote and a eukaryote. It's generally composed of polysaccharides and it's coming into contact with the environment. The main difference here in the glycocalyx between a proch and a euch is that eukaryotic cells generally have a very small glycocalyx. Um, if you remember in prochs, we saw pictures of capsules and they were huge, the big, thick, sugary coat protecting that prokaryotic cell. And a euch, the glycocalyx is usually quite small. It's just a thin coat of, of carbohydrates, sugars that are on the outside of the cell, um, not nearly as significant as it was in a prokaryotic cell. The job of the glycocalyx, yes, it can be used for attachment or adherence. Um, not as often as you see in prochs because it's just not as large and therefore not as sticky. Uh, the glycocalyx of a eukaryote can also be used for protection, largely I mean dehydration. Uh, the biggest job for a glycocalyx in a eukaryotic cell is contact with the environment. The glycocalyx is how eukaryotic cells interact with their environment. They can interact with other cells through glycocalyx. Um, they can interact with hard surfaces. They can interact with nutrients or signals that may be in the environment. That's generally what the glycocalyx is about uh, in a eukaryotic cell, is some sort of signaling with the environment. They send off signals and they receive signals through that sugary coat on the outside of the cell. All right, the cell wall of a eukaryotic cell. Um, the cell wall, th this is, there's huge variety in cell walls um, in eukaryotes. In prokaryotes, remember we were talking about peptidoglycan. Um, and there was the gram-positive and the gram-negative cell wall structure of a prokaryote, or rather I should say a bacteria. Uh, in a eukaryote, however, there's huge variety between different eukaryotic cells. What I can tell you is true always of a cell wall. If the cell wall is there, it's being used to provide support, uh, rigid structure and shape to the cell. It's giving the cell its shape, it's giving the cell its support. That's the job of the cell wall. Now, what is the cell wall made of? That differs greatly depending on the particular type of eukaryote that you're looking at. Plants and fungi have cell walls that are made up of either chitin or cellulose. Those are two different um, carbohydrates 
that very strong, rigid carbohydrates that, that can make up those structures. So um, sometimes in a plant, it will be cellulose. Fungi tend to be chitin. In algae, the type of cell wall material differs significantly. Um, sometimes it's cellulose like plants, it could be pectin, it could be silicon dioxide, which is like a glass like structure, it could be calcium carbonate, lots of different variety in algae, and of course, animal cells don't have a cell wall structure at all. So, not a lot of uh, similarity in structure, but the function is the same. If the eukaryotic cell has a cell wall, it's being used for shape, support, uh, rigidity for the cell. Now, of course, what you're never going to see in a eukaryotic cell, you will never see peptidoglycan in a eukaryotic cell. Peptidoglycan is bacteria only, highlight, underline. Right? So peptidoglycan is only ever found in the domain bacteria. You're never going to find that in a eukaryotic cell, and you won't find it in archaea. It's very specific to the domain bacteria. All right, cell membrane. If there is a cell wall in that eukaryotic cell, if we go in one layer, you'll be looking at the cell membrane. You can also call it the plasma membrane. Um, those terms, to me, are interchangeable, so that's fine. The structure of the cell membrane, structure you've no doubt seen before. It's very similar, almost identical, in fact, to the prokaryotic cell membrane. You have this phospholipid bilayer, um, the phospholipids here creating this hydrophilic outer section, right, on each end, and the hydrophobic section in the center. That's the value of the phospholipid bilayer. It's, it's providing this, this um, discrete distinction between the inside and outside of the cell through those phospholipids. There are proteins that cross through the phospholipid bilayer. Those are generally used for transport. Um, there are some carbohydrates as well. Those carbohydrates generally form the glycocalyx. So the, the carbohydrates will be attached to the surface of the membrane and then go out to form the glycocalyx to interact with the outside environment. Uh, so the job of the cell membrane here is to form a selectively permeable uh, membrane allowing things to, what you want to pass in, um, to come in, what you want to go out to pass out, but also very, very specifically regulating what's inside of the cell and what's not. So that's the value of, of the structure of the cell membrane, is it's selectively permeable. Allows some things in and keeps other things out. And of course, transport, allowing you to transport what you want through those proteins in the cell membrane structure. Now the difference here in, in cell membranes between prokes and eukes are that eukaryotic cell membranes contain sterols. Sterols are a type of lipid, um, and this type of lipid or fat gives extra rigidity, extra stability to the cell membrane. Prokaryotes don't have sterols. There's only one exception to that rule. Uh, but prokaryotes do not have sterols because they have peptidoglycan, which is giving that stability in their cell wall. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, do have sterols in their cell membranes. So this is a major difference between prokes and eukes, the presence of sterols. The type of sterol is different from one eukaryotic cell to the next. For example, animal membranes contain cholesterol. That's the sterol that we have in our membranes. Um, there is a phytosterol in plants. There is ergosterol in fungus. But eukaryotic cells have sterols of some sort in their membranes, uh, giving extra stability and rigidity to the cell membrane. And in fact, that's the problem with having too much cholesterol in your diet you have too much cholesterol, then your cell membranes literally get too rigid, uh, too rough, and the, cell, the blood cells cannot bend and flex the way they're supposed to. Uh, that's why you have to watch your cholesterol. Alright, so sterols are not found in bacteria. There is one exception, however, to that rule. If you look back at your prokaryotic notes, you're going to see the exception is a genus called mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is the only 
bacterial genus that does not have peptidoglycan. It's the one and only that doesn't have peptidoglycan, and therefore uh, they don't have the strength and support of a cell wall. And instead, what the cell has is sterols in its membrane. And that's an unusual situation. So mycoplasma is the one bacterial genus that does have sterols. All right, now inside of the cell. If we look inside of the cell, by far the largest um, structure that you see in a eukaryotic cell is the nucleus. Uh, the nucleus is um, surrounded by actually two membranes. It's two lipid bilayers. Uh, that's what you're seeing here. Two lipid bilayers come together uh, and they are connected, excuse me, they're connected by a group of proteins that together form this pore. Right? We call the, that structure, the two membranes together, we call that the nuclear envelope. Right? So the nuclear envelope is two bilayers connected by proteins that form these pores. And the pores, of course, are there to allow things into and out of the nucleus. So allows what needs to come in in and what needs to go out out uh, from that nucleus. And of course, what's inside of the nucleus is the DNA for the cell. Um, in a eukaryotic cell, the DNA is carried as individual pieces we call chromosomes. Right? So the DNA of a eukaryote is an individual segment called chromosomes. And of course you know that eukaryotes carry multiple copies of their DNA. Another structure that you'll see inside of the nucleus, if you, if you look at it under the scope, you're going to see this dark staining portion. This is called the nucleolus. Um, what's going on in the nucleolus? How is it different than the rest of the nucleus? The nucleolus is where RNA is being made. And that's where um, the early structures of ribosomes begin to be assembled there in the nucleolus. So uh, lots of activity going on there. RNA is being made. Um, early ribosome assembly is happening there in the nucleolus. Extending off of the uh, nucleus and the nuclear envelope is the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, there's two different types of endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. We'll talk about rough first. We'll come back to smooth in a moment. Uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum is really just an extension from the nuclear envelope. If you look in this diagram, right, in here is the nucleus where you would find the DNA of the cell and chromosomes. Here's the nuclear envelope, right? Um, you can see some nuclear pores here, allowing things to transport. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is simply an extension off the surface of the nuclear envelope. It's just more membranes folded off the surface um, of the nuclear envelope, and that's what forms the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, what makes this endoplasmic reticulum rough is the fact that it has ribosomes attached to its surface, and that's all the little black dots you see here. They're showing you um, all the little black ribosomes here attached to the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. In fact, that's what makes it rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you look at it under the microscope, it looks like little blobs attached to its surface. It looks rough. That's how it originally got its name. Now you guys know that ribosomes are used to produce proteins. So if the rough endoplasmic reticulum has a bunch of ribosomes attached to it, hopefully you're already putting together that that means that the RER is involved in protein synthesis, and that's exactly what it is for. Uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is involved in protein synthesis largely because of the ribosomes that are attached to its surface. Now in this diagram, they're showing um, the rough endoplasmic reticulum here. This inside portion they're showing in purple is the space between the membranes of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They would call that the, the lumen of the RER, right? that internal portion or the lumen of the RER. And what happens here is the ribosomes are attached to the outside of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and as the ribosomes produce their protein, they are squirting it in to the lumen of the RER. So the ribosomes are sitting on the outside of it, and as they make their protein, they're literally squirting that protein down into this purple lumen of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. We're going to see in a few moments 
that the protein made here by ribosomes on the RER is eventually going to be excreted from the cell. I'm going to talk more about that from a mo in a moment, but if you want to write in your notes that ribosomes on the RER make proteins that will be excreted from the cell, so proteins are, that are going to leave the cell. While we're here um, talking about the RER, let's also talk about those ribosomes, uh, and then we'll come back and kind of pull in the big picture of all of this process. The ribosomes. Um, ribosomes are very, very similar to what we saw with prokaryotes. Uh, ribosomes are composed of both ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, and proteins, and together that forms the ribosome structure. It's both RNA and proteins together. Uh, ribosomes, of course, in a eukaryote are ADS ribosomes. There are two subunits, the large subunit and the small subunit that you see um, in tan here, the large and the small subunit. In a eukaryotic cell, the small subunit is the 40S subunit and the large is the 60S subunit and together they form the ADS ribosome. Again, I know the math doesn't uh, add up here. It all has to do with what's called density centrifugation, how they measure Svedberg units. Um, you just got to remember it, that the small is the 40S, the large is the 60S, and together they form the ADS ribosome. Uh, remember the prokaryote was a 70S ribosome. Um, the job, of course, of the ribosome is the same, both in prox and eukes. The job of the ribosome is to make proteins. Now, there are two different kinds of ribosomes in a eukaryotic cell, what we call free ribosomes and bound ribosomes. Bound ribosomes are those that are attached to the surface of the RER. We saw those a moment ago. So bound ribosomes are attached to the surface of the RER. And in this electron micrograph, they're showing, you can see the layers of the rough endoplasmic reticulum with the ribosomes attached to the surface. Those are bound ribosomes. Bound ribosomes make proteins that will be excreted from the cell. Bound ribosomes make proteins that will be excreted from the cell. Free ribosomes, free ribosomes are just hanging out in the cytoplasm. They're not attached to anything. Free ribosomes make proteins that will stay in the cell. They make cellular proteins that are going to stay there in the cell. So two different kinds of ribosomes that are making slightly different proteins. Bound ribosomes make proteins that will be excreted out, and free ribosomes make proteins that are going to stay there inside of the cell. There is another type of endoplasmic reticulum that I want to mention while we're here. Um, this other type of endoplasmic reticulum is called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, or SER. Um, it is called smooth because there are no ribosomes attached to it. Notice here, uh, this is a nice picture showing you the nuclear envelope here. Uh, it extends off to form the rough endoplasmic reticulum, these layers and layers of membrane. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is also connected to the RER and the nuclear envelope. They are all connected together. So the nuclear envelope is connected to both the RER and the SER. It is one huge membrane system that extends off the surface of the nuclear envelope. They're all connected together in one huge big um, folded piece of membrane. Now it's called smooth endoplasmic reticulum because it does not have ribosomes attached to its surface, therefore it looks smooth under the scope. So of course it's not going to be used for protein synthesis because there are no ribosomes. So what is the job of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum? The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is largely used for uh, producing lipids, so it's synthesis and storage of lipids or fats. Um, in fact, all new membrane is originally made at the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Remember, membrane is made of phospholipids, which are a type of fat. And indeed, all new membrane originates here at the smooth ER. That's where it's originally made. The other really important job for the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is that it stores calcium ions uh, there in the SER. If you've taken physio, 
uh, you know that <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you know that calcium is important for signaling. In fact, it's one of the major ways that cells can signal to one another is through a flood of calcium being released. Well, that calcium is stored there in the SCR. And what happens is when it's time to signal to the neighboring cell, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum releases a flood of calcium that goes across to the other cell, signals to that cell, and then the smooth endoplasmic reticulum will pull it all back inside and wait for the next time to signal. So really important jobs here of the SCR are lipid production and storage and storing calcium, uh, largely for signaling. The other membrane-based uh, organelle that you see inside of a eukaryotic cell is called the Golgi. I believe your book calls it the Golgi apparatus. You can also call it the Golgi body, or you can just call it the Golgi. I'm fine with any of those. Um, the Golgi is also composed largely of um, membranes, but in this case, it is not connected to the other membrane systems. Let me say that again. The Golgi is not connected to any of the other membrane organelles. Golgi is not connected to the SCR. Golgi is not connected to the RER. It is not connected to the nuclear envelope. It is discrete and, and separated out from all of the other membrane systems. If you look at the uh, structure of the Golgi, it is membranes, and if you sort of look at it, they are individual sacs of membranes that have been flattened. They call that cisternae. So you can see these sacs of membrane like, like uh, sacks of membrane that have just been flattened and then stacked on top of each other. I always think it looks like a stack of pita bread on top of each other, and that's the basic structure of the Golgi, individual sacks of membrane flattened and then stacked on top of each other. Each individual sac they call cisternae. Now the job of the Golgi. The job of the Golgi is to sort of act like uh, the FedEx of the cell. The Golgi is going to take in bits and pieces from other membrane systems. It's going to modify, mature, sort out what it gets from these other membrane organelles, and then send it on to another location. So its job is modification, maturation, sorting, and the transport of proteins. That's the main job here um, of the Golgi. I'm going to go through that again, but before I do, uh, I want to tell you another term, a term that you will use from time to time. Um, you can see on this picture they're showing you a couple of different kinds of vesicles. A vesicle, uh, I want you to define vesicle in your notes because we will use that very often. A vesicle is a sac of membrane containing something. There are different kinds of vesicles, um, but it is a sac of membrane that has something inside of it. Uh, it would be a vesicle. Now what happens here is the Golgi is receiving vesicles from the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and it's receiving vesicles from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. You see the vesicles sort of melt into the cisternae of the Golgi. So the Golgi receives vesicles from the ER. It then looks at what's inside of that vesicle modifies it slightly, matures it slightly. It's going to put on a little shipping label onto whatever was inside of that, that vesicle, and then it will send it on to the whatever location it belongs to. That's why I call it FedEx. You know, FedEx's job is to receive packages, put on shipping labels, and send the packages to the right location. That's pretty much what the Golgi does. Golgi brings in, receives vesicles from uh, various organelles, takes that vesicle, looks at what's inside of it, modifies it. That's what we don't want FedEx doing, I suppose, but it will modify whatever's inside of that vesicle, decide where it goes, and slap on a shipping label and send the vesicle to the right location. And the Golgi can send vesicles all over the cell. Basically, anywhere there's a membrane, the Golgi could send a vesicle there. So the Golgi could send a vesicle back to the nuclear envelope. The Golgi could send a vesicle back to the endoplasmic reticulum, either the smooth or the rough. The Golgi could send a vesicle out to the cell membrane, 
right? Uh, it can send a vesicle anywhere there's membrane inside of the cell. So the Golgi's job, again, is to receive those vesicles, modify the contents, and then send the contents to the correct location. It's this central uh, organelle that's controlling all of these transport processes. So here's a diagram showing what I was just talking about. Uh, transport processes in the cell. Vesicles, these little uh, sacs of membrane containing something. Vesicles come in from the endoplasmic reticulum, either smooth or rough. They then go to the Golgi. The Golgi will modify and mature the contents and then send out new vesicles uh, to send that, that item wherever it belongs. And it can send vesicles to the nuclear envelope, to the ER, to the cell membrane. Now let's back up for a moment. We talked about um, production of proteins on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Um, by the way, let's look here at the structure. You can see the nuclear envelope is being shown in red. Notice it extends off to form the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It also forms a smooth endoplasmic reticulum that's all connected together. Um, on the surface of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, you find these ribosomes. They're showing in green. Remember, ribosomes are making proteins on the RER and squirting that protein into the center of the RER, into the lumen of the RER. Then what happens is a vesicle branches off from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. That vesicle will have the protein inside of it. Vesicle lands on the Golgi. The Golgi looks at that protein, modifies a little bit, decides where it belongs, and will send it outside of the cell uh, to secrete that protein outside of the cell. So remember when I told you that bound ribosomes make proteins that will be excreted from the cell, this is how it works. Ribosome makes it, squirts it into the RER, RER sends a vesicle to the Golgi, Golgi will then send a vesicle containing that protein to the cell membrane and release it out of the cell. Likewise, um, the, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum will send vesicles containing membranes and possibly calcium, new lipids. Uh, the SCR will send those vesicles to the Golgi. Golgi will modify whatever was inside of there and send it to the right location. Uh, so lot, lots of, of important work being done by the Golgi, controlling where things move inside of the cell. So vesicles from the ER containing proteins go to the Golgi for modification and maturation, and vesicles uh, transport proteins to organelles or secreting them to the outside environment. It's not just proteins that are moved around this way. It could be anything that's inside of those vesicles. Now before we move on in the structure here, we mentioned the term vesicle is this small sack of membrane that contains something. I want to specifically tell you about a type of vesicle that we will see um, over and over again, we're going to use uh, this type of vesicle. It becomes important for several different functions. Uh, this is called a lysosome. A lysosome is one type of vesicle, and a lysosome is a vesicle that contains digestive enzymes. So lysosomes contain digestive enzymes. They're vesicles that contain digestive enzymes. Now, lysosomes are used by several different kinds of eukaryotic cells. Let's go through this example. Um, for example, here you see this is a protozoan. We'll, t we'll see protozoans um, in a few moments. In the next lecture, we'll talk about them. Well, here's a protozoan cell, and this cell is encountering a food particle. So what it's going to do is it's going to bring this food particle into the cell in a vesicle. It literally reaches out with its cell membrane, surrounds the food particle, and then pulls the food particle into the cell inside of a vesicle. Right? That kind of vesicle is called a vacuole when it's got food inside of it. Now, the, the eukaryotic cell is going to take a lysosome that contains digestive enzymes and merge it with this vesicle containing the food. And, it, you know, you can see where this is going. A lysosome that has digestive enzymes encountering a food particle, it's going to digest that food particle. In fact, this is how many protozoans feed. They bring in food in a vesicle and they merge that vesicle with a lysosome to digest that food particle and absorb those nutrients out. Really important feeding process for uh, protozoans. In fact, we will see that your white blood cells use lysosomes as well. 
And this is how your white blood cells destroy bacteria during an infection. Your white blood cells will find not a food particle, but a bacteria. They will ingest that, that bacteria into a vesicle. They will merge that vesicle with a lysosome and allow the lysosome to digest the bacteria and kill it. They don't absorb the nutrients, they just spit out the debris and we call it pus. So lysosomes are important for feeding by protozoans and they're also important for your white blood cells um, in, in the destruction of, of uh, bacterial cells. All right, inside of that prokaryotic cell, um, we tend to think of the inside of a cell uh, as being a big slimy mass of just goo and no structure, just kind of a jelly-like mass. And that's true inside of a prokaryote. You do see just jelly-like cytoplasm inside of a prokaryote, but that's not true inside of a eukaryote. Inside of a eukaryote, things don't just float around. Uh, it's not just a jelly-like sac, but instead there is a whole cytoskeleton, this little structure um, for support and movement uh, that's inside of that eukaryotic cell. So the cytoskeleton is made largely of two different structures, what are called microfilaments and microtubules. Um, we'll talk about microtubules first. In this diagram, they're showing you microtubules in red. Um, the microtubules inside of the eukaryotic cell form a scaffolding network. Uh, they give the actual shape of the eukaryotic cell, especially a cell that doesn't have a cell wall. The shape is given by those microtubules and what kind of shape they form in the cytoskeleton. So one large purpose of microtubules is to form this scaffolding network that gives the cell shape. Um, we know that the microtubules also extend out to form the flagella. Remember, eukaryotic flagella are formed uh, from microtubules. So they extend out all the way to form a flagella um, on cells that have flagella. The other job of these microtubules is they actually um, provide a location for organelles to be. Organelles do not float around inside of the eukaryotic cell. They are actually anchored into a precise location by these microtubules. Right? The scaffolding network of microtubules actually holds organelles in certain locations inside of the cell. Not only do organelles not float around the cell, but really Nothing floats around the cell. Things don't just kind of diffuse across the cell. Instead, microtubules also provide this uh, intracellular transport system. I always sort of think of it like a monorail system. For example, I told you that vesicles come from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. They go to the Golgi, and then the Golgi will send vesicles out, uh, out of the cell, releasing that protein into the outside environment. Um, well, those vesicles don't actually just float around. Those vesicles ride on the microtubules like a monorail system. So the vesicle will come off of this rough endoplasmic reticulum and it will ride down on the microtubules until it gets to the Golgi, wherever that would be in this cell. Uh, so things aren't floating. They're actually riding around on this monorail system. I, you can also think of it sort of like a rack at a dry cleaner um, where things get attached to the microtubules and transported inside of the cell that way. The other uh, main component of the cytoskeleton in addition to the microtubules are the microfilaments. Uh, microfilaments are shown here in this um, pinkish purple color. The microfilaments are protein strands that line the inside of the eukaryotic cell. Um, they're lining the inside of the cell. They can expand and contract. They can change the shape of the cell by expanding and contracting, sort of like a belt can change the shape by um, expanding or contracting. They can also allow the cell to move. Um, it, that's how, for example, an amoeba moves. An amoeba can expand and contract its microfilaments, which pushes out part of the cell and allows it to change shape. Uh, so it's used for uh, shape as well as movement um, of a eukaryotic cell, these microfilaments. 
Now, there is nothing like this in prokaryotic land. Right? Prokaryotes do not have microtubules. They do not have microfilaments. As far as we currently understand it, things truly do float around inside of a prokaryotic cell. There's no microfilament, microtubule, cytoskeleton. Right? Nothing like that uh, in a proke. Another organelle um, that I want to talk about here, this is the mitochondria. Uh, mitochondria, everyone always thinks of it as the powerhouse of the cell. That cracks me up. I think it's a term they put in all sixth grade science books and everybody gets it stuck in their head, this powerhouse of the cell routine. Uh, but that's okay, that's what it's for. Uh, the main job of the mitochondria is indeed to make ATP, to make energy for the cell. The structure of the mitochondria is really unusual and interesting. The mitochondria is made up of two different membranes. You have the outer membrane here that's smooth. You have the inner membrane that is folded, right? highly folded inner membrane. Those folds of the inner membrane of the mitochondria are called cristae. So cristae are these inner foldings um, that you see in the mitochondria's inner membrane. Um, the job, of course, of the mitochondria is to make ATP, and indeed, the enzymes that are used to make ATP are located in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. That explains why it would have evolved to be highly folded, since, um, since the, the enzymes to make ATP are in the inner membrane, if you have more and more foldings, you have more surface area, which means you can pack in more ATP-producing enzymes. So that's why it would have evolved into this folded inner membrane structure. So ATP production enzymes are there in the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria. There are a couple of other interesting things about the mitochondria. It does divide independently of the larger cell. In other words, um, the mitochondria doesn't matter what's going on outside of the cell. If the mitochondria thinks it's time for it to divide, it will. It does that independently of what's happening in the larger cell. There is DNA inside of the mitochondria. It does carry its own DNA, and interestingly enough, it carries circular DNA. There are also ribosomes inside of the mitochondria, and interestingly enough, the ribosomes that are inside of the mitochondria are 70S ribosomes. A similar structure, although different function, we'll see with the chloroplast. Uh, chloroplast is not found in all, uh, pro in all eukaryotes. It's only found in those eukaryotic cells that are photosynthetic. So algae and plant cells carry chloroplasts. The structure of the chloroplast is sort of similar. You have an outer membrane that's smooth. You have the inner membrane that's folded. Um, they call this folded structure of the inner membrane thylakoids. So thylakoids are the inner folds. I always think it looks like a big stack of poker chips. Uh, and that's what the thylakoids look like in the inner membrane of the chloroplast. Now the job of the chloroplast is photosynthesis and the enzymes that run photosynthesis are embedded in this inner membrane. Right? It's very similar to mitochondria. What the enzymes are doing is different, but the structure is similar. So the enzymes used for photosynthesis are in the inner membrane of the chloroplast. Now the chloroplast also can divide independently of the larger cell, just like the mitochondria can. If the chloroplast believes it's time to divide, it can, regardless of what's happening. Um, also, the chloroplast does contain its own DNA, and you'll see here it is circular DNA that the chloroplast has, and it does contain its own ribosomes, and they are 70S ribosomes. Now, chloroplast, of course, is a cytophotosynthesis. Um, photosynthesis requires pigments, Pigments absorb light energy, so anytime there's photosynthesis going on, there must be pigments. Um, so sometimes it's green like chlorophyll, but it doesn't have to be. So you can always pick out photosynthetic cells because they'll be pigmented, either green or red or orange or brown. Now, so far, we know that both the mitochondria and the chloroplasts have some things that look like a prokaryotic cell. Um, the circular DNA, the 70S ribosomes.
that brings us to a very important concept um, in both evolution as well as microbiology. This is the, the theory of endosymbiosis, also called endosymbiotic theory. This is a theory that answers the question, where did the first eukaryotic cell come from? We know that prokaryotes were alone on the planet for, an, for quite a while, um, and we know that they evolved first, so the question is, how did a eukaryotic cell evolve from a prokaryotic cell? And uh, the theory of endosymbiosis answers that question. This theory was put out by a woman named Lynn Margulis. Uh, she, she sort of synthesized this theory using various lines of evidence, uh, both her own and other people's, and, and put this uh, whole idea together. All right, so here's how it works. Um, way back in evolutionary time, two billion years ago, uh, we're looking at where eukaryotes would have evolved from. We have these two different prokaryotes living side by side in this early uh, world a larger prokaryotic cell and a smaller prokaryotic cell. Um, we think that the nucleus probably evolved early on in the process. That would have come off from a... F that brings us to a very important concept um, in both evolution as well as microbiology. This is the, the theory of endosymbiosis, also called endosymbiotic theory. This is a theory that answers the question, where did the first eukaryotic cell come from? We know that prokaryotes were alone on the planet for, an, for quite a while, um, and we know that they evolved first, so the question is, how did a eukaryotic cell evolve from a prokaryotic cell? And uh, the theory of endosymbiosis answers that question. This theory was put out by a woman named Lynn Margulis, uh, she, she sort of synthesized this theory using various lines of evidence, uh, both her own and other people's, and, and put this uh, whole idea together. All right, so here's how it works. Um, way back in evolutionary time, two billion years ago, uh, we're looking at where eukaryotes would have evolved from. We have these two different prokaryotes living side by side in this early uh, world a larger prokaryotic cell and a smaller prokaryotic cell. Um, we think that the nucleus probably evolved early on in the process. That would have come off from, uh, from the cell membrane. So pieces of membrane pinched off from the cell membrane surrounded the nucleoid, the DNA, in order to form the early nucleus. So that probably evolved first, nucleus first. Next. Um, the large prokaryotic cell absorbed a smaller prokaryotic cell. We think it was something very similar to um, a purple bacteria, a type of bacteria. So the larger cell engulfed a smaller cell. Now, evolution tells us that these two cells only would have stayed together if they both benefited from this interaction. So what kind of benefits can we expect here? What would the larger cell, or let's look at the smaller cell first, what would the smaller cell get from this larger cell? Well, the smaller cell is, he's getting protection, of course, because he's inside of another cell. But he's also swimming around in this other cell's cytoplasm. So that's like a buffet of nutrients. He's in a very nutrient-rich environment. So the smaller cell would have gotten protection and nutrients from the larger cell. The larger cell, well, if this small cell is swimming around in all of these nutrients, he's making a lot of excess ATP. Well, that ATP can then be used by the larger cell. So it was a symbiotic relationship. They wanted to stay together because they were both benefiting. Eventually, that smaller prokaryotic cell was established inside of that larger cell and became what we now call the mitochondria. Eventually, over time, you start to see the membrane systems branching off from the nuclear envelope, uh, you're branching off to form endoplasmic reticulum. Eventually, that will also form the, the, the uh, Golgi and all the other membrane systems inside of the cell. Right? You see the mitochondria are established in this early eukaryote. Um, quite a bit later in evolutionary time, um, some of these early eukaryotes would have absorbed another bacteria, in this case a photosynthetic bacteria, 
Um, that photosynthetic bacteria would have been engulfed by the larger cell. Again, they only stay together if they both benefit. The smaller cell is going to be protected because he's inside of another cell. He's also going to uh, be in this nutrient-rich environment. The larger cell is going to get what's made during photosynthesis. And remember, what's made during photosynthesis are sugars. Uh, the larger cell would have loved that. So the larger cell is getting sugars produced during photosynthesis, not to mention oxygen being released as a byproduct um, of photosynthesis. So the so again, they stay together because they're both benefiting from this in this interaction. And eventually, the chloroplast evolved into what we now I'm sorry the the photosynthetic bacteria evolved into what we now call the chloroplast. Now. What kind of evidence do we have for this series of events? What kind of evidence do we have to support the idea that both mitochondria and chloroplasts evolved from prokaryotic cells living inside of another cell? Hopefully you're thinking back to the structure of mitochondria and chloroplasts to find your evidence. Remember, both, prokaryo both mitochondria and chloroplasts have two membranes, indicating that they likely came from some kind of endosymbiotic organism. They carry their own DNA, and it is circular DNA, like a prokaryote. They carry their own ribosomes, and they are 70S ribosomes, just like a prokaryote. They divide independently of the larger cell. Right, like an independent cell would. If we analyze their DNA sequence, we find that they have more DNA in common with bacteria than they do with the DNA in the nucleus of the very same cell. So they look like small prokaryotic cells inside of this larger eukaryotic cell. So there's quite a bit of evidence actually to support this theory that both mitochondria and chloroplasts evolved from um, this this, this sort of arrangement, this endosymbiotic arrangement. Now, I have a thought-provoking question for you. I presented the order of these events being that first the mitochondria formed and then later in evolutionary time the chloroplast entered. How do we know that this is the order of events? How do we know that the mitochondria is older than chloroplasts? And by all means, we do know that. So how do we know? How do we know that mitochondria came first and chloroplasts came later? I'm not going to answer it. I'm going to let you guys cogitate that, and we will talk about it uh, in, in lab in our meeting during week three. Uh, we'll talk about this. So I'm going to let you kind of think about that and come up with your, your evidence for how we know that mitochondria evolved first. All right, so, so a couple of study ideas. I posted this. I don't usually put this in, but um, since this is a hybrid course, I wanted you guys to kind of have these to think about. We're going to talk more about it in our, our study time during our lab meeting. But by all means, you should be thinking about difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. In fact, I would encourage you to make lists of differences between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. This is a great way to study, right? So close your notes and just make a list of as many differences as you can think of. Uh, and then go through your notes and see what you missed. That's a great active study technique. Uh, now, in a medical perspective, how could these differences be important, right? Why are those differences so important? For example, if you wanted to treat a patient, and your patient has eukaryotic cells, if you wanted to treat a patient that has eukaryotic cells for a bacterial